thermo couples were actually discovered in the early 1800s. Started all with a scientist named Jean Charles Peltier who discovered the Peltier effect in the year 1821. But the best thing was even though this effect was discovered such early for commercial application it took a lot of years due to a major drawback. But before that first let us learn the basic understanding of it. So here's the head sheath and a thermocouple that is usually the assembly for a thermocouple to be used. Now in order to understand the working it has two metals which are welded together and on the junction which has one is the hot junction so we have a candle here heating it and then you have a cold junction to it now what happens here is as the heat is produced the electrons here would start to vibrate and then they would start to travel back to the cold junction according to this an EMF would be created but this EMF is proportional to the difference in the temperature between the two junctions the scientists used this to understand the temperature of an unknown object. For example, here we want to know the heat. So here's the hot junction to it. Here's the cold junction, which is put in an ice bath. Why? Because the output EMF is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the two junctions. So for example, if you put the cold junction at 0 degree Celsius, the EMF would be corresponding only to the temperature of the hot junction. And that is how scientists would use this to measure in their laboratories. But the question arised is what about in industries? So the answer to that is cold junction compensation. So if you look at cold junction compensation basically, imagine that I have two junctions which is the hot junction and cold junction. Now instead of having the ice bath here, what do we do is first we find out the output. What was the output? It is the temperature at the hot junction minus the temperature at the cold junction, the EMF that is generated. So let the EMF come from the hot junction. For the cold junction side, we'll put a temperature measurement device, which is kind of like a thermistor, a low cost device. This low cost device will basically be used just to measure the ambient temperature. So for example, the millivolt generated is from the cold junction is in this red symbol. Now this will be fed to the processor, which will basically minus whatever is the millivolt that has been generated by the cold junction. And thus you would get a millivolt that is proportional only to the hot junction. Because of this, the thermocouple manufacturing increased and the production was required at a record level. Thermocouples can now be divided into into various types as per what metal con configuration we select. So it, the most common is the K type, but you have lot of types. For example, N, E, J, T, C, B, R, S, oh my God. But let's try to divide them. So basically these three which you see on the left hand side are nothing but made of noble metals like platinum, rhodium in different proportion and configuration. These three metals are usually preferred only when the other regular type of metals are not applicable. So let us look at the thumb rules as to how can you select which type of thermocouple to be used when. The first thing is type K thermocouples. Type K are the most widely used thermocouples. So we'll look at when to use and when not to use these thermocouples as per APA RP551 page number 30. So first thing is before we start with K type, let us know what is K type made up of. So K type has the positive side and the negative to it. So the positive is made up of nickel and chromium and the negative is made up of nickel and aluminum to it. This can usually be used up till 1260 degrees Celsius. As a safety margin around you can say 1000 degree Celsius is what I personally recommend. Then is you cannot use this in H2 environment as per API RP standard. Why? Especially between 800 to 1000 degree Celsius range. Why? Because a thermocouple when it is put in the service of hydrogen at such high temperatures, the hydrogen would break at such high temperatures and these H1 molecules will basically try to hit the sheath. Then the thermocouple and enter in inside the thermocouple and damage and give you false readings. Also in oxidizing environment, it is preferred not to use K-type thermocouples because of the green rot effect type E type thermocouples. Now if you see the EMF chart versus the temperature, you would notice that for type E thermocouples, the EMF generated is the highest, which is around 78 or 79 millivolt if you see. And for K type, it is just 42. So in cases where you require the highest EMF, that is usually in high noise requirements or where there is high vibration in the environment, E type is the most preferred type in those cases. Next is in cryogenic applications. When you see the cryogenic application, the temperatures go maybe up till minus 186 degrees Celsius or something, especially when it is liquid nitrogen or 
LPG, etc. For those cases, type T might be a preferred choice. This is my personal recommendation as per inputs from various side people in terms of its stability and design basis. Otherwise, you can use for very high temperatures if it goes up till 1200 degrees Celsius above. Maybe type B is a suitable choice. Again, you need to discuss to an expert about it. But ideally, you can use this as thumb rules while selecting it. Now, one of the most important part to know is about type J thermocouples. J thermocouples have the positive and the negative section with the positive having is iron and the negative having is constant in which is copper and nickel. So remember that iron is not an easy metal. Iron is very prone to rusting. So ideally as per APA RP recommendation, this should be a legacy choice and only if there is absolutely no choice available. Otherwise, you have to keep this as a non recommended choice for majority of the project applications. I would like to share is we can't give jobs by this video, right? But this videos can help you learn. And especially if you learn in depth, it can help you get feedback like this where you can land new job. So for that case, if you want to learn in depth, then there is a playlist and free ebooks available, which are given in the description below. So you can check that out. Also, if you would like to be more than just an average engineer and if you ask any expert on the planet on any top companies, they would tell you that to be an expert engineer, you need to have an unsatiable hunger to learn in depth. And one of the most common documents for every engineer to learn in depth is nothing but a PNID. Keeping this in mind, a course is developed on Udemy on how to read PNIDs from zero to an expert. And people have said it's a clickbait because you get to learn so much more than just PNIDs. I think you would find this course valuable. If yes, the link is also given in the description below. Let's meet there, learn something new. 